Good morning. morning. Welcome to Hammer Creek this morning. Our first song, Shine Jesus Shine.
year. Just want to make a special note of uh, Taylor Martin turning three, and then Brennan Hoover turning ten. Just remember to wish them a happy birthday. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll ask the ushers to come forward here. Uh, this Sunday's offering is for the church budget, and next Sunday's offering is also for the church budget. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning that we could be here. I thank you for uh, the great and awesome God you are and, and uh, the beauty of the spring here. And I uh, just thank you for all the blessings you've given us. And I pray that you would just use this offering to further your kingdom. For our children's song this morning, we'll be doing the joy, joy, joy down in our hearts. <laughs> joyful this morning because we have the love of Jesus in our hearts. I invite the congregation to stand and join us in worship. Our first song, How Great Is Our God.
Amen. Our next song this morning is actually a familiar hymn to many, but it's not in our hymnals. It's Constantly Abiding. Um, there's just, uh, this song speaks about a peace in my heart that the world never gives, and that we can find that peace when we're spending time with Christ. And he promises us to never leave us. You'll notice that in the chorus. Uh, just a reminder, when we get to the chorus, the men and the women do sing separate parts, but that'll be listed uh, on the PowerPoint there. song is Days of Elijah. Draw. 
Well, good morning, Hammer Creek. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Thank you, Dawson and team, for leading us. I trust that your words, um, your, the vibrancy with which you sang is a testimony. Perhaps we could just go home now because uh, really those words were powerful and a testimony of your lips, I trust to be true for you. It's, uh, it's my joy to serve um, as your bishop and it's always a joy for me to be here. I always count it a privilege when, when I'm here and to engage with your leadership team. I'm blessed by your team. You have a very high functioning team and a team that works in great unity together, serves together, and is committed to this church. And I just want to um, take an opportunity just to say thank you to your team here and also to remember to keep praying for them. Um, this morning in your mailboxes on behalf of the leadership team, I just simply want to acknowledge that Rick, your pastor, Rick Neuswanger, has written a letter to the church. As many of you know, he and his family have been on a journey the last several years. And Rick is simply just disclosing that or offering invitation to, for an awareness 
and also for each of you to uh, pray for him and the family uh, as they continue to journey into uh, the realities that they face. So on behalf of, of Rick and the Newswanger family, simply want to say take time to read it and also to, uh, to continue to pray for, for Rick and the family going forward. Before we go to the Word this morning, um, I'd like to bring a, a brief update on our conference and also on our district uh, as well. Back in February, back in February, LMC, Langstrom Internet Conference, which we are part of, our district, um, there's three more congregations joined our conference and um, came into LMC, and two of them came into our district. Two of the three came into our district, Ark Bible Chapel up in Brooks County in Woodchopper Town, and also Zion Mennonite near Ole, uh, near, um, Ole also joined as well. And so our district, Valley Mountain, PA East, now has 23 congregations. That's a lot of churches. Uh, it's grown by five uh, since I'm bishop uh, in four years. It actually all came in last year. And so Eric, gives over, so Eric Marshall gives oversight to eight churches. Jim White gives oversight to nine, and I give oversight to six. And so between the three of us um, share in that capacity together working as a team. And there continues to be an influx of congregations seeking fellowship with LMC. That is uh, particularly right now from the Virginia Conference and from the South Central Conference, uh, which would be in, from Kansas south down through Texas, Oklahoma, over to the edge of Arizona. And uh, to the tune of around 20 to 40 congregations are seeking fellowship. And um, matter of fact, this coming week, Bishop Samuel Lopez, um, who lives in New Holland, gives oversight to the Shalom, Shalom Council, is meeting with about a dozen churches in Texas, all Spanish-speaking, that are seeking fellowship with LMC. So the challenge is, is to manage this growth well. And from the bishop board and the, and the bishop elder team, managing all that um, takes time and energy but it also takes some bandwidth, and so there continues to be that reality of uh, navigating that well and doing that with excellence. So across LMC this morning, even as we're worshiping here this morning, there's right around 300 churches in our conference. We're speaking 12 different languages in 16 different states and in five different nations. Um, many of you traditionally thinking of Lancaster as being very Lancaster-centric, Lancaster is no longer the case in five different nations this morning. And one of those nations is Cuba. Cuba is home to nine LMC churches. Did you know that? Nine LMC churches in Cuba. And so back in February, I was invited by Bishop Samuel Lopez. He gives oversight to the Shalom, Shalom, Council, Shalom Council and also is the overseer, the bishop, for the churches in, in, in Honduras, Mexico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. And uh, he invited me to go with him to Cuba. I've never been there before. I traveled much of the globe, but never been to Cuba. And so if this is your image of Cuba, when you think of old cars, that's a very accurate image. A lot of old cars because of the, uh, a lot of old Rus American cars and a lot of old Russian cars because of all the embargoes that have been in place for the last almost 60 years. And it is a socialist country, and uh, we were granted religious visas to go there, which actually gave us a lot of freedoms, as long as we did what we said we would do, and we would be where we would, 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 said we would be. But I just want to share a couple of pictures with you this morning, and um, I, I, across my own congregation at Weaverland and, and some other congregations in our, in our district, said we should send as much as we can to bless the churches there, the nine churches. We were going there for the assembly, their, uh, their spring assembly. And so when I gathered all my stuff just given to me, I filled nine suitcases, big suitcases, packed to the max. And so there is me on the top picture at the Philadelphia airport at two o'clock in the morning, the city of brotherly love, dragging nine suitcases through a long line. And there was a doubt in my mind for a moment that I thought to myself, there is no way that all nine suitcases are going to be in Havana a couple hours later. But in faith, said, okay, it's in the Lord's hands. And when you know it, about four hours later, we landed in Havana, and all nine suitcases there arrived safely. And a uh, picture there of distributing them to uh, the church leaders um, 
And, and what we basically filled with was, was toothbrushes, toothpaste, toilet paper, uh, uh, over-the-counter meds, and that sort of thing. And um, um, the, we had 14 suitcases all together. And this pastor on the right, he's holding a, a, a roll of toilet paper and toothbrush and toothpaste. And just to put context to this, most persons in Cuba, average wage is $6 per month. A gallon of gas cost over $6. And when we met for the assembly, we met at a, a Catholic convent is where we met, and they had three good meals a day. And when he was gifted this toilet paper and this toothbrush, we were made aware that most had not had any meat, any milk, any toothpaste or toothbrush or toilet paper since February a year ago. And it just became a reality. Even Samuel Lopez says he noticed how thin many of the leaders were who are sacrificing the little bit they have for other needs within their church. And, but this, the malnourishment is a very, very real thing. And so uh, I just uh, a picture of socialism. If I could have a picture of socialism, and it's evil. It is evil. It's not of God because it's robbing humans of their dignity and their ability to, to do with excellence the gifts that God has given them. But if I could put into, into socialism and its evil in three pictures, this would be it. First picture here is just the, the poverty and the broken roads and the old cars and, and just a, a very gloom-filled, hopeless situation. Um, one pastor was so blunt as saying that in Cuba, without Christ, hope is gone. There is no hope. It, it just does not exist. And so um, the bottom picture here is a four-lane highway that we traveled on. And this is at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning. I stood right in the middle of the road. I would not advise doing that tomorrow. It's in 222. 10 o'clock. As far as I could see on a Monday morning, no cars either direction. Because you can't afford to drive. You can't afford to buy a car, much less drive a car. And so that's just a reality. And we were at a pastor's house, and, and he... Um, um, I saw on the refrigerator, just like our refrigerators at home, we have pictures on them, right? And I saw this picture on the refrigerator, and, and I, I noticed there's a, a picture of a little girl at the top, and it turns out it was a granddaughter. And I says, well, what's, what's that say? It was in Spanish, of course, and the drawing didn't make a lot of sense to me. And it was interpreted to me and said, this, this, there's, there's a tree here, and the tree is talking to a little butterfly. If you can see it, the butterfly's at the top of the drawing. And the tree is saying to the butterfly, Butterfly, why are you so sad? And a butterfly responds, Because I have no color. Now, out of the mouth of children, Jesus says, comes words of wisdom. And that is so true, literally and also spiritually. <coughs> there's no color there. And for this little girl, there's no crayons. There's no, there's no color pencils. There's no markers. And she had to draw this picture with, with a, a pencil. And so that's just a reality. But in the midst of all this hopelessness, there's the church. These nine LMC churches, thriving, doing well, as well as could be in a socialist reality. And um, here are four missionaries. I was privileged to take her along, along about $4,000 in cash and to leave it there with the churches. And here's four leaders that are being commissioned to, to, send out, to be sent out and to plant more churches. And uh, while there, we attended two different graduations, much like LMC STEP program, except it's in, in Cuba in a Spanish setting. One church graduated 23 and the other graduated nine. And it was just an incredible, incredible joy uh, to, to do that. So the reality is it's a beautiful people, um, just a beautiful people there. Um, and while there, the Lord put on my heart through the, through the leaders there, they said, Brian, can you help us? When you get back home, will you, will you help get aid to us? And so I made a verbal commitment to the leaders there that I will do everything in my power and everything, all the connections that I have to be able to get help. MCC does have shipments to, to Cuba. And through a very complicated and hard to understand reality, none of that aid is reaching LMC churches. It's reaching Cuba, but not reaching the LMC churches. And so I have been blessed by LMC to work at trying to get a container 
I purchased a 40-foot container, and um, once we can get the permitting in order and get a shipping date, assuredly, I will be circling back to your leadership here of filling this 40-foot container with, with human, human aid for, for Cuba. Um, so stay tuned to that, but the, there's, there's a, a beautiful people there, and this morning, I think it behooves us here in Lancaster County, A, to be reminded of, of who we are, the languages that our conference speaks, and also our brothers and sisters, LMC brothers and sisters who are suffering uh, in other parts of the world and only 94 miles off the coast of Florida. It's not that far away. So I just offer you that, uh, but more info will be coming and uh, I'll apprise you of that as it becomes known. Well, this morning, the devil's favorite color. Have your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Peter. And let's press into this question and invite you to join me for a word of prayer. Father, as we open up the word this morning, I pray, Father, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, as we sang this morning about constantly abiding, and Lord, the promises that we sang, Lord, as we open up the scriptures, may you touch us and minister to us. May we have humble hearts and open hearts to hear your voice, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Back in 1958, the Kareola Crayon Company produced its first ever box of 64 crayons. <coughs> Looked something like this. And some 12 years later in 1970, a six-year-old boy received his first box of 64 crayons, complete with a built-in crayon sharpener. I was deliriously happy. <laughs> but there's something about the smell of crayons that probably takes us all back to childhood, regardless of our age. It's a beautiful re aroma, and many floods of, of memories can, can come back. And Shirley and I, for each of our grandsons, when they reach their seventh birthday, we take them to the Crayola factory, the Crayola Crayon factory, uh, in Easton, which is up in Northampton County, just north of here. And they have all kinds of fun and educational uh, centers for the children. It's designed for small children. And, and one of these centers has a, a place where a child takes, picks out one of these 64 crayons, and they, make it so they name it. They, they, they name their own color. And they put it in the machine, and the machine cranks out a, a labeler, and it spits out the label, and then you affix it to their color crayon, and they name whatever name they want it to be. And each of us, and so our grandsons, when we take them, they pick out their favorite color, and they make a name for it. Each of us here this morning, we probably have a favorite color, just by virtue of, or one that we're, we're drawn to. I wonder this morning, does God the author of all color, does God have a favorite color? I think creation would testify that God delights in lots of color. That's just the heartbeat of God, from tropical fish to flowers to the sky, and it just goes on and on and on. The color of people's skin and eye colors and, and so forth. Likewise, did you ever wonder, does the devil have a favorite color? And if so, what, what color might that be? Perhaps that's a very strange question, one that you never thought about before. But I believe if we enjoy and, and appreciate the many colors which God created, we would be well served to, to consider what might be a favorite color of the enemy of Satan. From what I've read from out throughout scripture, I would suggest that the devil does have a favorite color. And I'd like us to consider that this morning. So then how might the enemy of our soul use his favorite color against us, against the church, against you and me? And here in 2 Peter, the author, Peter, a fisherman by trade, uneducated from Capernaum, the same small town as Jesus in the same area. Peter, one of the 12 disciples, one of the three in Christ's 
most inner circle, the, the, the inner three there, was, was privy to some of the most intimate times and spaces and also some of the most difficult moments in Christ's ministry, including being witness to the raising of dead, the dead girl, being witness to the transfiguration of Christ that only Elijah and Moses and James and John had joined, and also invited to go deep with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. A disciple conflicted and confused at times, but faithful. He was faithful. Peter was executed for his faith in the back streets of Rome in the same manner as, as his Lord was in 64 of the common era, crucified on a cross upside down. And so here is Peter speaking to us before his death. Listen for this very clear word coming from this very tender heart of a disciple of Jesus. First, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in, with, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you will be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully, willfully forgot, that by the word of God the heavens were, out of, were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded by water. But the heavens and the earth which were now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the day, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away, and with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will, will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, and also as our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, and also in all his epistles, speaking in in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which are untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do to the rest of scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall, fall down from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. These first two words of this chapter is beloved. Beloved is, he begins this way. It appears four times in what I just read to you. And this, this original word is, is it's translated from, from, the, uh, from the Greek. It, it's this endearment of, of, what, of what Peter is saying. Peter had heard God speak and with his own, with his own ears and as God spoke this exact same word that Peter heard God speak when Jesus was transfigured. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so this, this bumpy road, it's interesting that Peter picks up on that word beloved that he heard God speak. But this bumpy road that Peter 
was on, this, this long, luckily this very strong personality that he had, a strong type A personality. He's a bit crusty and often a, a bit belligerent and, and a most unlikely disciples. But four times in these 17, 18 verses, he uses the word beloved. And he writes this heartfelt appeal to us of warning to stimulate wholesome thinking. Well, why is he causing us to remember? And it's this first point here that the rock, Peter's called a rock. On his confession, Jesus said, on this rock, Peter, your confession, the rock remembers. He remembers well the enemy's ability to undermine and deceive the steadfast faith. And, and context matter, Context always matters. And so let's new, not to isolate this nuance of this word beloved from the former person we knew as Peter and the Peter now writing. So he's desiring here in verse 1 to stir up pure minds by way of reminder. To remember. Peter's speaking from experience. He's speaking from experience. He's called by Jesus himself a rock as he made this in incredible confession of faith that Jesus, you're the Christ and the Son of the living God. Peter's the only one to walk on water, the only disciple. And he's also the only disciple to rebuke Jesus when Jesus spoke of his suffering. And he went from a rock to a, to a stumbling block and he, Jesus gives him that sharp word to get behind me, Satan. He's the only disciple to walk on water and also the only one to be rebuked by Jesus in, in the garden for resisting uh, what was about to happen and, and taking up his sword against the priest of the high, the high ser uh, the, uh, servant. And he's the only disciple to walk on water, but yet when things were put to the only, ultimate test, he was the only disciple to deny Jesus publicly three times. Three times. And he's also was restored by Jesus three times when he asked, when Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? The point being the rock, Peter remembers. He remembers the enemy's ability to undermine and deceive a steadfast faith. And so he's this identity and who he is and whose he is. And Peter is stirred up here to encouraging us to remember, to remember that he too is deceived and undermined so subtly and yet so very deliberately. So this text is full of warning for you and I because I submit to you that a favorite color of the enemy is off-white. The favorite color of Satan is off-white. And if desired, I could provide you no less than 17 New Testament references that I believe testify that the favorite color of Satan is off-white. In other words, just slightly off-white. Just a little bit tainted. Not much, just a little bit. Virtually unnoticeable, unless one is very attentive. The greatest test of the early church was not only uh, persecution from from without, outside the church, but also from, from within, the, the, through heresy and through false teachers. Followers of faith who, who knew the truth, who knew their creator, and now Peter says, verse 5, are walking according to their own lusts. They willfully forgot. They willfully forgot. Drift happens. It happens in our life. I, I'm reminded of this some time ago when, when I was at the ocean and, and out... In, uh, in, in the ocean for, for maybe 45 minutes and, and just enjoying myself and, and unbeknownst to me, I'm not attentive to an, under, an undercurrent and it's gen every, every wave that crashes, it's taking me a couple feet down, down, down the beach. And after a bit, I look on the shoreline and say, I don't see my umbrella anymore. Or there's a landmark, it, it just looks different. That's how drift happens. It's just subtle. And that's what Peter is warning us of because that's the color of Satan, just a little bit off white. And so we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, fix our eyes on the shoreline and fix our eyes to know that our eyes are fixed, that we do not drift. At Crayola, there are four colors in the white department. Just four. You go to a paint store, there's probably 50. But at Corral, there's four colors in the white department. 
And the closest one to white is called Timberwolf. Now, I'm enough of a preacher that I'm looking at these colors and saying, wow, isn't that interesting? The closest one to white is called Timberwolf. Now, I'm sure Crayola, whenever they came up with this name, because most, most of their crayon names are named by children. They come from ideas from children. So I, my guess is they, there's nothing spiritual behind them naming this Timberwolf. But I couldn't help but make this connection of this off-white being so close. The closest to white is called Timberwolf. And Jesus said that I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. And so the reality of this close color in the Crayola world is Timberwolf. What an application, a spiritual application for, for you and I. Of this enemy, this timber wolf, this enemy of our souls whose mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. Off-white, a favorite color of Satan. And what ends up happening is that this off-white color is a scheme and it's often prime. This primer is often a question. And I give you there's a reference way back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. That's how the enemy works, with a question. In the beginning, Satan quotes God, but he twists just a word or two and he asks a question. It's so close. It's so close to what God said, but just a little off. And an off-white question is referenced here by Peter in verse 3. This question circling uh, Peter's audience, he says, they're saying that all things continue as, as they are, and, and where is the promise of, of, of the Lord's return and his coming? <laughs> And then scoffers, he said, begin to stir up doubt in their questions, which undermines faith, rather than stirring up remembrance, which solidifies faith. How different this question would be if, if they had said that, even though things continue as they are, Lord, remind me of, again of, of the promises of your coming. And so Peter calls out this, this subtle question, slightly off-white that was circling his audience. And so this question, it circles yet today. And one hardly needs to look very far. And it just gives you this as a, as, a, as a reference from the Barna group, George Barna. And kind of a staggering statistics, but in 2020, more Americans believe in Satan, 56% of Americans believe in Satan, than believe in God at 51%. Now just sit with that for a moment. More people believe that Jesus was divine and a sinner than believe that he is divine and sinless. Now, friends, that didn't happen overnight. That happened a little bit of a drift at a time. And so Barney goes on to say, this is he himself, he says, all of the spiritual noise, the drifting, the off-white, in our culture over the last few decades has obviously confused and misled hundreds of millions of people in our nation. The message to churches, to Hammer Creek, Christian leaders and edu educators is clear. We can no longer assume that people have a solid grasp of even the most basic biblical principles such as those concerning the existence and the nature of God. Now that's a very sobering and can be a, a, a somewhat of a depressing reality. But this off-white, the, 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 the appeal for sharing this is this subtle color is hardly noticeable. Yet as this text demonstrates and as this statistics also testify, this becomes the hinge point when there's a question and it and it's, takes, its its, takes its own reality when things can fly off the tracks and it becomes a very end reality. And so the warning for us is that deliberate forgetfulness creates colorblindness, which leads to a twisted and destructive theology. So in this text here that I just read in verse 8 and 9, Peter speaks very explicitly. He's saying, Friends, don't forget this one thing. Don't forget this one thing. The Lord is not slack or slow in keeping his promises. In other words, Peter's saying, don't put God to the test. Don't test God. To, de to deliberately forget is not robotic. It, it's, it's, it's not that we're robot or to be a puppet. It, it's a personal decision made by free human will to deliberately forget. It's a choice. A choice to which each of us are responsible and to which each of us will give an answer. 
To deliberately forget launches one on a trajectory which will result in a twisted theology and a destructive theology. These are not my words, but the words of, of Peter here. And the one can become colorblind, where we no longer can discern, discern the colors. We no longer discern the truth from a lie and calling evil good and good evil. And Peter uses here in, in verse 16, he uses this word twist. It's the only time that word is used in the entire New Testament. It means literally to torture. It's the same word that's used when they put people in a rack, when they, when they put them on this torture machine and, and they rip them limb from limb. It's the exact same, exact same word. That's a graphic image that to help uh, to make the point. But the end result with the devil using his favorite color, this off-white, the, the devil accomplishing his mission to kill, to steal, and destroy. And as that earlier statistic said, we see it happening, where more Americans believe in Satan than believe in God. So here in this text of 2 Peter 3, it's filled with warning to his friends, to the church, to you and to me. And he's writing here, and here in verse 11, he pauses and he asks a question. What kind of persons ought we to be? That's a needed question here in 2024. What kind of persons ought we to be? So let me just close with these four observations from the text. What sort of people must we be? Holy and godly, a color discerning people. Able to discern the colors. Not colorblind, but able to discern colors. Verse 11, very clear. We're to be holy and godly people, and we become a discerner of colors, and not that we're colorblind. We have the ability to recognize truth and untruth, truth and a lie. And when something seems off or the color doesn't seem quite right, we can recognize it. This is a gift of God, of discernment, of being able to discern colors and being able to discern things in our heart when something seems off. That's the Holy Spirit within us. Being able to discern good and evil, a truth and a lie, righteousness and unrighteousness. We can discern the colors of the day and the voices of the day, which then allows us to be, point B, spotless and blameless and at peace because by choosing the true color, the color of Jesus, we are saved. We are saved. Here, Peter says, he says, spotless and blameless and at peace, not because of ourself, in spite of ourself, but because we choose the true color, Jesus, we are saved. And we can have assurance of salvation. We can, as we confess Jesus as Lord, it's under the blood. And he no longer sees us, but he sees the blood applied to us. And who knew this better, friends, than Peter. Peter knew this full well, one who denied Jesus three times in the hearing of Christ. His identity in who he is and whose he is here is truly solidified in 2 Peter. Peter here is blameless and at peace and it's something that we can also know for ourselves. And as we declare that Jesus is Lord, then it also we're declaring that I am not. You are not Lord. And we become grounded and guarded. And so what kind of people... Must we be grounded and guarded in Christ because we know our colors. We know our colors. We can distinguish this. And he says here in verse 17, he says, he warns us, beware, be on guard. Don't be carried away by, by the error of lawless men to know our weakness, to know our risk, our vulnerabilities, our ability to drift, just to know that we can drift, to know our colors. And we can be grounded and guarded only if we know our colors. Just like a young child who one of the first things that they begin to learn is their colors. And parents test them on their colors and, and they call it purple and it's purple, it's not pink. Uh, how wrong it would be for a parent to teach her children the wrong colors. Well, we can trust God doing the same thing, the Holy Spirit in us, that we know our colors. God's word is true. Same with a child that learns what a hot oven is. When we tell them it's hot, don't touch. They learn that or they risk getting burned. What sort of people must we be? We must be grounded and guarded. And we must also be growing, growing self and others through our knowledge of the true color. These final words here of, of, of Peter, verse 18, his final words, 
the last word I, I, I wrote, this is his last recorded words. When he was ex died exactly, we don't know, but, but there's no other words beyond this for, from the Apostle Peter. But look what he says here in verse 18. But grow. It's an exhortation. He's saying grow. Grow in knowledge. Go, grow in grace. Grow because we know the true color. Grow others. Peter went on to stand. He stood the test. He kept the faith. Crucified on a cross upside down in Rome in, in 69. And so the appeal here, the invitation is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to him, he says, be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. May we do so to the glory of God because we know the true color. Would you stand with me? Lord, thank you for the Apostle Peter. And you give, you give him, in all his ugliness, his failures, but Lord, we can be grateful and we celebrate this morning that that's, that is part of his story, but it's not the last word. Lord, Peter, this man who so many times couldn't get out of his own way, and yet, Lord, these final words, his exhortation to us, Lord, to be on guard, to be mindful, to know our colors, to acknowledge that we have an enemy, and, and who knew that better than him? Lord, we do well to be reminded that there's not much distance between a Peter's story and Judas's story. And yet they ended in two different kingdoms. Father, I pray this morning that as a church, as your people, we can be reminded and also the value of the body of Christ. Lord, that we discern together, we journey together, we, as a community of of believers, Father, we can be inspired and grow together. So, Father, bless Hammer Creek this morning. Lord, bless them. May they continue to be found faithful. And, Lord, may we be found to be the sort of people that Peter speaks of here, a people that are grounded and guarded, a people that are spotless and blameless, a people who are growing. So, Father, to that end we pray. So now, Father, I leave them with these words, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.